I want to start by acknowledging that we're all coming to this meeting from diverse lands. Obviously, we have two wonderful UK panellists today, but for those of us in Australia, I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to the meeting from Gadigal land and that uh, many of our participants are, are at the ANU on the land of the Narwhal and Nambri people. And I want to pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging and to all um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues joining us. And as I said yesterday, I think it's important to use that as an occasion to recognise their amazing custodianship and to recommit ourselves to recognition of sovereignty and voice in um, the Australian Constitution. So this has been a wonderful discussion and Tarun and Jeff, you'll be glad to know that both of your ideas featured yesterday in um, the panel discussions. Um, and therefore our, our panelists today need no introduction. But let me just note that we are very fortunate to have Tarun Kaitan and Jeff King, respectively from Oxford Law and UCL joining us. Tarun, as you know, um, cut his teeth on inequality and wrote one of the leading uh, you know, global treatments of equality and anti-discrimination law that was recognised in a variety of contexts, including in the context of, uh, is it the Leverhulme um, Prize? Tarun, am I saying it correctly? Is that right? Um, or am I getting it wrong? But many prizes. And he was a colleague of ours at Melbourne and is now um, back at uh, Oxford, where he has a variety of appointments in the Faculty of Law and at the Bonavira Institute. Um, and he will soon be jetting across um, to be a, a visitor at my um, former uh, alma mater, if you like, um, the University of Chicago. Tarun's work in recent years has focused on a range of topics, including fourth branch and guarantor institutions, which you'll be glad to know Tarun. Uh, Dinesha and Anna talked about in some detail yesterday in the context of their idea of proximate institutions. And we heard from um, Lindsay Bladen about uh, a range of institutions that support uh, constitutionalism in the positive sense. Um, so today we're delighted to hear Tarun on plutocracy and liberal constitutionalism. Our second panellist in reverse order on the program is Jeff King, Professor at UCL. Jeff's work on the rule of law has been seminal in the field and encourages us all to rethink this foundational ideal. Of course, he's also an expert and a leading thinker on social rights, uh, and he's starting to tackle a broader range of issues around material inequality and the, and the focus of this conference. Jeff, yesterday we heard you in the room uh, in absentia and the call that you have made to think more heavily about you know, labour rights, unions, tax, transfer and the welfare state in the context of these broader debates. So with no further ado and introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Tarun. To Tarun. I'll remind you that there are a variety of ways to ask questions. Um, you can raise your hand virtually or um, in person. Leighton will help me if I can't see people in the room in Canberra. And if you put your um, comments and questions in the chat or the q and I'll be keeping a close eye on those uh, and read them out uh, in Q&A to our panellists. So thank you so much. Uh, and Tarun, over to you. Thanks very much, Rose. And um, just start by apologising um, for not fully participating in this panel. It is quite late here. I did manage to attend the first session uh, yesterday. Um, and so if a lot of what I say has already been covered, my apologies for that, but hopefully uh, there will be something new to talk about. But I, I do want to pick up on um, uh, someone's uh, keynote speech yesterday where he uh, made three main claims. The first that sufficiency is necessary, uh, but not sufficient for justice. The second, that material equality is a key demand of justice. And third, that human rights, even in their best image, <clears throat> at best seek uh, sufficiency, but not material equality. Uh, as it happens, I agree with all three of his claims. And in fact, uh, that is a very good foundation for, uh, for my paper uh, to, uh, to, to, to take off. So I'm going to make three broad claims um, with Moen's claims in the background. The first is that uh, liberal norms cannot be and should not be reduced to human rights norms. Human rights are a relatively new and recent development in liberal thought. Uh, and certainly do not exhaust it. 
this is not a claim I'm going to develop very much uh, as an argument, but in the second half of my talk, when I think about possibilities um, that liberal states uh, have in dealing with plutocracy, you will see where I'm coming from. The second claim, which I will uh, begin with, <clears throat> is a claim that uh, liberalism, at least instrumentally, requires a significant measure of equality. So unlike Moyn's claim that equality is inherently uh, desirable, I, don't, I have no fight with that claim, and there may be various bases for, those, for that claim, including liberal bases. Um, I'm going to make a narrower, but not for that reason, any less important claim that, uh, that liberalism instrumentally requires a fair measure of equality. And finally, uh, that liberalism has the tools to secure um, that measure of equality. Uh, the second claim, which is the first part of my talk, is conceptual and normative, and I largely draw upon liberal uh, political theory. The second claim is a composite, is based on a composite collection of best practice of states that call themselves liberal or aspirationally liberal. Um, so it looks at the constitutional practices of these states to build, build a claim about the possibilities within, within the liberal tradition. And when it goes beyond practice, it does so only incrementally in a way that I don't think um, uh, any, any liberals should take, most liberals should take uh, offense to. Uh, in some ways, the strategy is the opposite of what Kim Lane Shepley calls the Frankenstein uh, state, where uh, you take the worst path of good regimes to build uh, a horrible um, monster. Uh, I'm doing the opposite. I'm taking the best parts uh, of multiple regimes to see what, what we can come up with. Um, the paper is, uh, is already uh, pub published in Global Constitutionalism, at least the basic idea is published. I just posted a link. Um, I just, so the paper is, is motivated by three broad irritations. Um, despite the increasing talk of equality in constitutional studies, like everything else, the center of gravity of equality talk and constitution studies has remained firmly in the United States. And like everything else has been inflected with, uh, at least to me, an irritating American exceptionalism where the arguments for equality in constitutionalism uh, are based largely on extremely contextual, contextually specific historical claims about what American constitution requires, I'm going to make a more general claim about liberal constitutional theory. And secondly, in a lot of this neo literature that has come out in the last few years, the concern is with middle America. I'm interested in the bottom 20%, uh, roughly speaking, the relative poor and not, not in the middle class. And third, the concern in a lot of this neo literature is motivated in the context of populism which worries about inequality for stability reasons that the poor will rebel, are rebelling against the system, will break the system, and therefore we must need to do some, we must do something to ameliorate. So while my account is um, instrumental in the sense that liberalism requires uh, a measure of equality, uh, it is not motivated by uh, simply stability concerns. Uh, without a measure of equality, key liberal values are in serious um, danger of being violated. Okay, so uh, with all those caveats out of the way, I'm going to um, start uh, with two fundamental liberal premises. Um, these are liberal constitutionalist premises, which I believe are quite uh, mainstream, they're not controversial, or not hugely controversial. Um, the, and I'm, I'm borrowing explicitly from Sujit Chaudhary's work here. Uh, the first is that liberal constitutions impose a legitimacy constraint um, on states. Uh, and key to this legitimacy constraint, uh, at least in Rawlsian terms, is uh, a right to fair political opportunity which is the right to hold public office and to influence outcome of political decisions. 
um, this right must be available to all persons uh, and by implication to all groups. This constraint also translates into what Chaudhry calls the stability constraint, the constraint that has been referred to in the American literature, which uh, worries about any group permanently or semi-permanently being locked out of power. And the worry is that any group which is locked out of power in a constitutional system uh, has all the incentives to go outside it, to use violence against it uh, and append it rather than to play by it by its rules and therefore not only is the right thing to do but it also makes sense to um, to ensure that uh, no group is permanently locked out of power. So um, however we define political equality, any semi-permanent political lockout of a group is contrary to liberal constitutionalism, at least in its uh, contemporary form. There are many circumstances where mere form formal equality of vote fails to satisfy these constraints. And there are numerous examples, especially in deeply divided society, where liberal constitutionalism has accepted the need to go beyond formal equality of votes to ensure that no uh, minority group is locked out of power. And, and I'm obviously referring to multiple consociational uh, measures uh, for racial or religious minorities, which are given uh, some form of political insurance uh, and Ross has uh, done some fantastic work on the idea as well. So, uh, so this idea of political insurance for groups that are in danger of being democratically locked out is not a new one. Uh, and it's actually quite central to liberal thought. So here's the argument, but here are these steps in my argument which I'll briefly outline. The first is that, um, and <clears throat> This is, again, I don't think controversial that neoliberal policies, uh, even if we accept that they lift all votes, increase inequality. The second step in the argument looks at the nature of power. Um, inequality, definitionally, is a difference in what material resources you and I control, and that gives rise to relational power. And in the paper, I make three claims. Uh, about the nature of power. Uh, the first is drawn from Stephen Lukes, uh, who talks about power um, as having three dimensions. The first is or three types of power. The power, my power to get you to do something that you don't want to do is me having relational power over you. The second is a more subtle form of power, which is my power to determine the agenda uh, for collective decision making. But the third, uh, what he calls latent power or extremely subtle form of power uh, is sociocultural and ideological patterns which are structured within society. And this, this power operates so subtly that its wielders and its victims uh, often do not realize that power is operating. So this power operates, but it's not necessarily exercised. And you know, if you prefer the Marxist terminology, this is what Gramsci would call hegemon. Um, so this is the first feature of power that I want to note, which is that power is subtle and power can be very subtle. Note, however, that this is why the stability constraint may not be enough to worry about poverty and liberal constitutionalism because we, you know, again, to use a Marxist terminology, false consciousness, you can get the poor to vote against themselves, etc. The second feature of power is that power is convertible. Power does not respect its particular domain of material, social, cultural, or political. Unlike Plato's ideal republic or Walzer's uh, complex equality, where the domains were sealed uh, and not uh, breachable, in our real societies, these borders are extremely porous, but not only are they porous, power has the character of trying to convert itself in whichever domain it obtains, economic power will try to convert itself to political power. Social power will try to manifest itself in economic power and so on and vice versa too. The third feature of power is that power is resilient. Power is in constitutional studies, we often talk about the idea of self-enforcing constitutions. Right? Power is the ultimate self-enforcing phenomenon. Power begets power. Power over time left unchecked is self-aggrandizing, it deepens itself, it 
overreaches, it uh, is extremely stable. So what are, if you accept these claims about power, what are the implications for relative poverty? I'm not, I'm assuming sufficiency. I'm not talking about basic needs not being met. Um, but the implications to my mind are these. Right? Convertibility ensures that one person, one vote, um, formal political equality is not adequate and will never be adequate in satisfying the liberal ideal of fair political equality of opportunity uh, because material, gross material inequality will convert itself into, seek to convert itself into political power and manifest itself in political uh, differences. The second implication is that the subtlety of power, of this power makes it extremely difficult to identify, to challenge and to mobilize against. The third, that the convertibility of political power to economic power also ensures that when poor people do get access to power, their connection with their class is typically broken. In at least in liberal societies, which like to pay their elected representatives well, unlike racial or religious minorities, uh, elected representatives who used to be poor but are no longer poor do not have the same um, deep connection with their with their social group. So, adding the resilience of power to this account. Um, in the backdrop of neoliberal politics and traditional liberal rights, including the right to poverty, it should not surprise us that most, uh, many at least, if not most liberal democracies today um, are plutocracies. And, uh, and once you are a plutocracy, I, I, I think that both, at least the, um, the legitimacy constraint of liberal constitutionalism uh, has been breached. Now, this is a constitutional theory problem and not just a pol political theory problem because of this phenomenon of permanent lockout or permanent political lockout of the poor from power. Um, in fact, it's rather surprising that uh, those who are sensitive to this problem uh, refuse to see the problem of material inequality as a constitutional problem and insisted on it being a policy problem for certain uh, reasons that I'll come to in, in just a moment. Right. But, <clears throat> oh, actually, let me tell you. So th there were two broad objections. Uh, the first is the Rosian objection, and the second is a more recent one. The first is the objection from transparency and institutional concerns. And the best reading of Rose from Michael Mann's work and some other scholars who worked upon it, is that uh, the first worry is transparency, that the anti-poverty, anti, the egalitarian norm may be too opaque for citizens to know when it's breached, unless you judicialize it. And that gives rise to the counter-majoritarian. Difficulty obviously those being aware of the American uh, system was extremely sensitive to the counter-majoritarian difficulty. Um, the second objection is from the limited potency of politics objection, which uh, is often in the strong form, I think it's clearly wrong that politics cannot fix uh, equality. Uh, I think there is sufficient data, quantitative data to show that the political ideology of the party in power does have an impact on, um, on the extent of inequality. Uh, the weaker version of uh, the objection is that political interventions can backfire, can have unintended consequences. So both the worry about uncertainty judicial and judicial role, and the worry about the problem of unintended consequences and therefore leaving enough flexibility, I see them not as objections, but as design uh, instructions to thinking about poverty in constitutionalism. These are important uh, objections, but not objections that cannot be overcome. So that's the first part of the uh, presentation. The second part will be a lot shorter, so I'm not going to go over my time, hopefully. Um, the second part of the paper moves to thinking about if material inequality is such a big problem, uh, such a big normative problem, albeit instrumentally for liberal 
constitutionalism, what can liberal constitutions do about it, if anything at all? Um, now, this is obviously speculative um, because, because it's a composite picture of the possibilities. I've mapped the broad strategies that may be employed by liberal states against plutocracy into two categories. The first is the category of egalitarian uh, strategies. These are strategies that seek to directly reduce economic power by closing the gap between the relative poor and the relative rich. The second set of strategies are anti-plutocratic strategies. These are strategies that seek to stop or push against the conversion of economic power into political power. Uh, needless to say, these strategies are not mutually exclusive. Um, both types of strategies are available uh, within the liberal framework. Uh, what I'm going to present are some highlights of each type of strategy. It's not a manifesto, it's a map. Context is obviously extremely important here, but the idea is to push against, uh, uh... <laughs> yes, sorry, Ro uh, Ross, I just saw your message. Okay, so here are the multi-pronged possibilities with egalitarian solutions uh, or um, egalitarian possibilities. Uh, at an ideational level, uh, I think the biggest uh, promise of constitutionalism uh, was still born in the American case of uh, slaughter, uh, slaughterhouse cases, where uh, the broader pro promise of the 14th Amendment um, and the possibility that it could actually include material uh, inequality within its remit was firmly rejected by the, uh, by the increasingly conservative post uh, reconstruction American Supreme Court, which narrowly tied it down to what uh, uh, Professor Moen yesterday called status inequality, uh, and that too, only in the context of race. But, uh, but while that might have been a historical accident, there's no reason why that cannot be undone, at least at an ideational level, at least at the level of uh, what Jeff has called mission statements, uh, preambular, declarations, uh, directive principles, um, and I'll come to directives in just a moment. I'm posting a link here to another paper on directives where uh, a lot of the post-colonial states in the global south uh, enshrined these political directives to their non-judicial organs to, to seek, amongst other things, uh, material um, equality or to close the gap between the rich and the poor. Um, what do these uh, ideational values of material uh, inequality do in a constitutional context where you don't want to empower judges uh, to give orders about reducing uh, inequality? Uh, then arguably their most important role is as interpretive aids to push against an overexpansive right to property. Um, and there is a lot of work that I think is waiting to be done to, to think conceptually about a sharp distinction between um, property rights uh, of individuals to property, which is personal, residential, et cetera, and property rights uh, of large companies in, in form of stocks and shares. Um, and it, I find it hard to believe that any robust conception of human rights should naturally extend uh, to the latter. So. Um, so with these ideational uh, tools in place, the right to property can at least be contained to not stand in the way when political organs take steps to, to seek uh, material inequality, uh, to reduce material inequality. Uh, Professor Moyen also talked, I think quite rightly, about the dangers of asking judges to, to, uh, to rule on discrimination against the poor in a context where the society is so fundamentally organized uh, on capitalist lines. Um, I think it's too much for judges to expect, and it might even draw down the standards in other types of discrimination cases like race and gender inequality. But what judges can do um, is uh, a procedural right, uh, which has become extremely powerful in British law. Uh, it's a due regard duty, uh, which is actually enshrined in section one of the British Equality Act, 
the duty on public authorities to give due regard to the need to reduce inequality in every decision that they make. It hasn't been brought into force in England for the past 12 years for a reason, because it might just be effective. Uh, judges are a lot more comfortable telling political organs, you haven't got it right, go back and do it again, uh, instead of telling them, uh, we will do, uh, we'll tell you what the right thing to do is. Um, the egalitarian directives, uh, like Article 38 of India and Section 36 of Canada, can also uh, be the foundations of robust uh, antitrust and anti-monopoly uh, regulations. And finally, uh, on this line of equality directives, I want to mention two new constitutional experiments where people have often worried about directives that you know these are pious statements that don't do anything. Um, but at least some new constitutions are thinking about mechanisms of political enforcement in creative ways. So for example, Nepal has a standing parliamentary committee uh, uh, to, to look into the enforcement of constitutional directives. Thailand requires every new government to present a program of enforcement of directives to parliament within 100 days of taking office. So this agenda setting role that raises the constitutional and political salience of directives uh, can achieve, it can go some way. Think about, think about uh, when the 2020 ratio becomes as important as the GDP ratio in every budget and enterprise and constitutions can play a role in increasing the political salience of that uh, kind of enterprise. The second set of measures are anti-plutocratic solutions that are aimed at stopping conversion of economic power into political power. This is harder because it's a constantly moving target. Uh, because power is also resilient and adaptable, it will always gain the regulation. So regulation has to keep one step ahead. And here, I think there is a very important role for a much uh, more robustly imagined electoral commissions and, uh, in imagining um, regulation of political finance as I think a paradigmatic example of guarantor institutions, which is uh, another paper I've just uh, posted the link to. So I have some thoughts about that, but I know I'm running out of time, so I'll move quickly. Uh, this is where flexibility is the most important because uh, any regulation against plutocracy that is written down would be gamed very soon. And if that's hard to change and entrenched, uh, then power will win this game. Um, there are other ideas that can be exp in, uh, explored other than uh, guarantor branch institutions, which are what uh, Gargarella has called engine room solutions. Um, these are a mixed pack and I have a lot of skepticism uh, about the identification uh, of legitimate genuine representatives of the poor who will remain those representatives after accessing power. Um, but there is work to be done there in, in terms of, uh, you know, there's a lot of work on um, uh, citizens assemblies going on today, uh, which are generally random and issue based. I, again, I have worries about those processes, but uh, I don't want to rule them out entirely as uh, they, they may at least play some advisory role. Um, the Dutch style economic and social council with broad representatives from governments, corporations, trade unions, NGOs, uh, et cetera, with a strong egalitarian mandate is another option within liberal states. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's, that's a long list of possibilities. There are many others in the paper if you're interested. Are these moves liberal? I believe they are because they're drawn from the practice of liberals, from self-professed liberal states. Um, and if fair political participation is a fundamentally liberal right, then all of these are natural corollaries. I don't think they require a fundamental reorientation of, of how liberal states currently practice. Um, in conclusion, I would nod to the global dimension. Uh, inequality uh, within states is a consequence of certain um, global economic uh, orders and structures that individual states do not have the capacity uh, to change on their own, but collective action here uh, is, is possible if enough states go down this route. So um, I end with an optimistic note, uh, optimistic about the possibility of um, 
what uh, Rawls described as liberal socialism, and I'll end with a quote from Rawls where he said that laissez-faire capitalism um, secures only formal equality and rejects the fair value of equal political liberties, and welfare state capitalism also rejects the fair value of political liberties. So, so for all uh, for all his uh, connection with all the connection between liberalism and capitalism, uh, Rawls was at least of the view that uh, liberalism and capitalism are mutually incompatible and that for the, the only way for a state to be liberal, to be genuinely liberal, is either to be socialist or, or property owning. So um, anyway, I'll end up that role uh, on that note and thank you very much for your time and patience. Thanks Tarun. <clears throat> it was really a lovely wide ranging um, sense of your thinking on these issues and a beautiful um, sort of you know, continuation of where Will Bateman ended yesterday when he said that the, the kind of discretion required of central banks in order to prop up the welfare state was incompatible with a certain kind of Dicean conception of liberalism. And so, um, you know, there's a really beautiful continuation. Um, I have been playing with uh, Turun in the chat for those in the room by, um, pressing on the ambiguity between his pronunciation of Roz and Rawls, um, which is a very flattering, um, you know, ambiguity, but of course not one he intended. Um, now we are turning to Jeff King, who uh, is going to talk on the rule of law, the state and inequality. But as I said, drawing in some of those themes that we've already introduced from his own thinking yesterday. Thanks so much, Jeff. It's a great pleasure. Um, and I'd like to, to thank you, Roz, uh, for the warm introduction. I'd like to congratulate the organizers of this conference for putting together such <clears throat> an outstanding lineup of speakers and a conceptually enlightened program as well. So inequality, I think, is with climate change and COVID-19 really one of the defining challenges of our time. And in the short presentation I do today, I want to explore how the social problem of inequality relates to a core principle in public law, namely the rule of law. I want to explore the somehow fraught relationship between the rule of law, the state, and inequality by looking at the conceptual underpinnings of the idea of the rule of law and its relationship to the state, the concept of the state, I also want to look at the value uh, of the rule of law and how it figured in the early uh, 20th century development of the administrative state, in Britain in particular. And then I want to explore the relationship between neoliberalism and the rule of law, and indeed between neo neoliberalism and the formalist conception of the rule of law, namely the one by Fuller and Raz, that so many people seem to adopt these days. And ultimately, I'll be arguing that uh, we need to reconceptualize the rule of law to think about it differently. And I also want to argue that a reconceptualization of it in the direction of a regulatory um, or anti arbitrariness conception is worthwhile. We shouldn't abandon the rule of law. What I think we need is a pro regulatory, pro state account of the rule of law. And that's part of a larger project of mine, something I'm writing a book on, but I'll identify some others that are involved in that project as well. So let me just share my screen. I'm afraid I'll throw some PowerPoint at you over the course of this uh, discussion. Here we go, great. Now, um, Here we go. First, some preliminaries. Oops, that shouldn't be there. How should that? <laughs> Sorry, I, I need to... Um, Take your time, to... Jeff, don't worry. Yeah. If anyone has any questions for Tarun that occur to them in the meantime, please feel free. Um, to indicate that to Leighton. Did you want to take questions now? No, no, I was just saying no. while yeah. Jeff gets just, his uh, sure. gets gets his um, slides working, you could see if there's anyone who and, wants to register their interest. And, to and also, I might say, people online, if you can put the 
question in the Q&A function rather than the chat. It just separates it off um, for us to see more clearly. Ah, many apologies for that. Um, so let me begin with a few preliminaries. I'll, I'll need to be quick here. I wanted to define what type of inequality I have in mind in this discussion. And the short answer is three types, economic inequality, status inequality, and political inequality. Um, there's plenty to say about each. I won't say much about them, but I think that when I discuss the relationship between the inequality, the, value, the problem of inequality and the value of the rule of law, these are the types that I have in mind. They don't track each other, but I'm not just exclusively concerned with economic inequality. So what I want to ask about how inequality corrodes the rule of law itself, even before we get into definitions. I think there are certain ways it clearly does that. First and foremost, inequality exacerbates access to justice problems. And it occurs not only through unequal material access to judicial procedures, but also unequal levels of rights consciousness that can actually prevent people from recognizing justiciable problems as things they could take to the courts. Secondly, inequality fosters corruption. Uh, and corruption is essentially a form of unlawful activity that distorts the regular application of law. Anyone who's lived in a corrupt, corrupt country will, will have a sense of how odious that is to the rule of law. Thirdly, unequal distribution of wealth in particular can encourage people to use constitutional law in the legislative process to lock in economic advantages such as favorable taxation which can promote social apartheid effectively through tiered social institutions like classes. And over time, that will have the effect of decreasing trust in institutions and therefore respect for the moral validity of enacted law. And it will promote unlawful behavior and that will frustrate citizens' abilities to rely on the law. Now that's a lot of empirical claims I'm making and there is an ample literature setting out all of those claims as well. It's not a straightforward link between uh, inequality and disobedience to the law, but there is enough evidence to show that there is um, a correlation between those things. The fourth is that uh, inequality is associated with higher levels of, uh, of crime and also with physical violence in particular. And higher crime levels will often beget more punitive, punitive systems of criminal justice which can promote recidivism and then create intense resentment amongst the social classes that bear the consequences of uh, that recidivism and that exposure to violence and the criminal justice system. Now on any sound view of the rule of law, the inability to use the courts, extensive corruption, disregard from the law and outright violence are serious rule of law problems that are caused by inequality. Now I start this discussion on the assumption that in order to deal with economic inequality in particular, but also status and political inequality, you need to have a robust welfare and regulatory state that can redistribute wealth, that can promote equal education, can provide a system of courts that's accessible. So the question I want to move on to is, is there something inherently hostile or antagonistic between the very idea of the state and the idea of the rule of law. We can start by looking at the often made distinction between the German Gleichstadt principle and the idea of the rule of law. That this is, here's an example of this distinction being pressed by Michel Rosenfeld, who says, the Gleichstadt is best understood as state, through, state rule through law. Um, a formula reminiscent of the expression rule by law. The rule of law, on the other hand, is seen as more antagonistic. It's rooted in norms that pre-exist and transcend the state and can be invoked against it. So here we have the impression of uh, the rule of law being loyal to the, the sort of idea that the law is customary and pre-exists the state. Now that, that um, conception 
is part of what is often referred to as the ancient constitution and its understanding of the relationship between the crown and law in English legal history. So Bracken's famous treatise on the, the law and customs of England, this is an early medieval treatise, had a, a claim that law makes the king in it. The king makes, will continue to make law, but the law will also uh, recognize the authority of the king and it precedes the king. And there was a political philosophy essentially drawn out from this. It's detailed extensively in Pocock's great work, The Ancient Constitution and the Feudal Law. And he shows that the tradition of Whig liberalism recognized customary norms that, uh, that had been recognized throughout the ages and which predated the Norman conquest and served to legitimize and recognize authority but which pre-existed it. Now these theories existed before the development of the modern state. And this is the kind of thing that Rosenfeld is contending for here. Now there were two theories also alive in that medieval period that seemed to be at one with um, natural law theories, but also Roman law. And they were a flat negation of the rule of law idea uh, and a uh, flat negation of the idea of the ancient constitution. One is that um, the king is released from the laws. The laws don't control the king. The other is that what pleases the prince has the power of law. These were two tenets of law that had great purchase in, uh, throughout Europe in the, in the Middle Ages. And they were also affirmed by English jurists like Bracton. This is before the separation from the church. Um, but there was a distinct reception of them into English constitutional history, which recognized the ongoing uh, significance of the law in a way that was not often done elsewhere in continental Europe. So the, the thesis that Rosenfeld is pushing here is essentially that, um, that the natural law and Roman law theories uh, uh, animated the absolutist attitudes of James I and Charles I in 17th century England at the time of the great constitutional controversies, the Civil War, the Restoration, the Glorious Revolution. It's when Thomas Hobbes and John Locke wrote their great treatises. It was the contest between royal power and parliamentary power. And James I had a clear dispute with his judge, Sir Edward Coke, or Chief Justice, Sir Edward Coke, where James pressed the view that I've just set out, that he's, he is the author of the law and will determine what the law is. And Coke famously refused that view in the case of prohibitions. Coke was dismissed by James in 1616 for the content of his opinions. And Charles I, who succeeded James and had a similar view, was dismissed by Oliver Cromwell in a grisly fashion after the Civil War in 1649. Now, what does this have to do with the state? Quentin Skinner, uh, in this terrific essay, Genealogy of the Modern State, identifies traditions of thought about the state that were alive in the early 17th century. And effectively, one of them had an absolutist conception of the state. The, the authority of the state, this is associated with Robert Filmer, was based on divine right. The, 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 the monarch is the head of state, but cannot be removed from that power, it requires absolute obedience to the monarch. Um, and although this sounds very Hobbesian, in fact, Hobbes differed from this conception in some ways. And Hobbes didn't publish the Leviathan until the mid uh, 17th century, whereas these views were, were dominant in the discussion leading up to the Civil War in 1640. The populist conception, on the other hand, thought that the sovereignty of the state rested in the body of the people, and, and in the people in particular through parliament. And the king held office on a limited mandate. Now, the idea, of course, that I think Rosenfeld and others are pushing is that the idea of the state is associated with the absolutist conception and the idea of the rule of law is located in a more populist or constitutional conception. But the fact is, is that both sides in this debate affirmed the role of and the idea of the state. They recognized the monarch as an office holder. They differed on key points, on the source of the monarch's authority, on whether total obedience was required, um, and on whether the monarch's authority was uh, bound by law or simply was the law. But they both at the same time affirmed the idea 
of the state as, as, as existing, the commonwealth. Hobbes rejected elements of the absolutist conception, but explained the role of the state as a fictitious person, which the monarch would represent as the head of state. The monarch would be charged with securing the benefits of mutual covenanting between citizens. So Hobbes had a, a conception, of course, of the state, which required total obedience to the monarch, but he still viewed the monarch's authority as deriving from the consent of the governed. Uh, Locke's constitutionalist case um, was is sort of better known, but the point is that in both the case of Hobbes and in Locke, we have a conception of the state, of the commonwealth, that both affirmed as necessary. Here we are with, with, um, with uh, Hobbes and Locke. Now, um, following the 17th century, it's often noticed that British public law was slow to develop a concept of the state. There was skepticism from Jeremy Bentham, from Harold Lasky. There were diverse reasons for that skepticism. Um, part of it was that the, the idea of the state was viewed as a form of metaphysical nonsense, which confused notions of sovereignty, crown, parliament, courts, and it was better to speak of those things in isolation. This is the kind of view that Bentham had. And Harold Lasky had a more pluralist conception of the state. He thought there were diverse sources of authority in modern society. He was influenced heavily by Marx, of course, who had a very poor view of the state, so, which is contrary to what many people think <clears throat> of Karl Marx. Janet McLean has a wonderful Book, and I can say, having looked at it again after reading a lot of these original thinkers, I can see that, that McLean's book is a truly outstanding piece of scholarship that explores these themes in the search for the state in British legal thought. The point here is that uh, whether or not there was a, uh, a fully developed theory of the state in the late 19th and 20th century, it certainly was part of the real public law uh, discourse, at least in the courts, it's the crown as corporation soul. It was part of the philosophical discussions in the 17th century and the political discussions. And, and so the, the charge that the, the rule of law has an anti-state bias straight through the 17th century and up until the present one doesn't seem to stick. Now, you could ask whether this confusion over the existence of the state had any impact on the state's ability, the, the, let's, the, the actual British state's ability to address inequality. And that takes us to the theme of the rule of law in the administrative state in the 20th century. Now, I'll assume many are familiar with Dicey's critique of the collectivist state it's not so clear in the introduction to the study of the law of the constitution. It is set out quite extravagantly in law and public opinion. Um, Dicey's opposition to the welfare state is, was notorious. I'm interested in what political impact that had. Dicey was influential politically, but uh, Gordon Ewart uh, was, was very influential. Hewitt, uh, the author of this tract, The New Despotism, was a, elected as a liberal MP in 1913. He became the Attorney General in 1919, and then later the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales in 1922. And he wrote this book, The New Despotism. It was actually serialized for publication as a series of articles. And he attacked the idea of the nascent administrative states. So he, he speaks of the creed of the ardent bureaucrat, the amateur of the new despotism, as being that the only persons fit to govern are experts. And the only obstacle to that is the sovereign parliament and the rule of law. And then he adds, and of course, the sovereignty of parliament and the rule of law are the two key constitutional principles in Dicey. He adds that the expert must use the first, that is the sovereignty of parliament, in order to frustrate the second, that is the rule of law. And that is by adopting broad delegated powers with ouster clauses and Henry VIII powers and so on. And this was described at the time as an undisguised attack on the civil service. And it was of such political significance that the Committee on Ministers' Powers, the so-called Donamore Committee, which was chaired by Lord Donamore, was formed in order to investigate the charges that Hewitt was making to see if they, they held water. The committee 
unanimously and in a cross-party committee rejected Hewitt's claims as, a, as being exaggerated even though they represented quite a bit of the bar. So in other words, when a government committee was appointed to examine the proposed incongruity between the administrative state and the rule of law, it unanimously rejected the claim that they were incongruous. And another piece of interesting trivia here is that Harold Lasky sat on that uh, committee. He was a political theorist, but he was also a senior member of the British Labour Party. Uh, a bit later than at this time. He became the chair of the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party and was a frequent correspondence, a correspondent with Oliver Wendell Holmes. Lasky sat on the committee and he included an annex where he addressed the idea that there should be a system, a separate system of administrative courts that, so that public law could be applied not by the ordinary judges, but by special judges as it was in France. The committee rejected that proposal and he added an annex to explain uh, why he also agreed with the proposal to not have a separate system of administrative adjudication. And he gave this as one of his reasons, the historical principle of the rule of law cannot, I think, be better protected than by making the ordinary judges the men who decide the legality of executive action. Now this is coming from a scholar and a politician who was uh, increasingly to the far left as his career progressed. And, and Lasky's later works, A Grammar of Politics, also recognized the importance of the rule of law. So if we combine this reaction of the Donamar Committee with also some important precedents, such as the case of Ehrlich, which affirmed that judges wouldn't get too involved with planning, such as the case of Wensbury, which is a hallmark of judicial deference, on um, challenging the, the substance of administrative decisions. If we look furthermore to the next developments, the Beveridge Report of 1942, which created a cradle to grave system of social security. If we look to the, the, the provision of the Legal Aid and Advice Bill, uh, which became the first systematic public provision of legal aid, You'll see that in the second reading debate, Jowett, speaking for the Labour Party, said, began his speech by observing that every country which lives under the rule of law must have some system of legal aid. So you'll see these senior Labour politicians also discussing and using the ideas of the rule of law. So although there is some use of the idea, just as there was use of the idea of freedom against the construction of the welfare state, we also see the idea of the rule of law being used within traditional social democratic circles. Now, we have to fast forward and take seriously the advent of neoliberalism. We can only have to fast forward to right after the war when the Mount Pelerin Society was created. This is a society whose statement of aims include um, a, um, a commitment to us reestablishing the rule of law and assuring its development in such a manner that individuals and groups are not in a position to encroach on the freedom of others. The, this is the essence, this is the birth point of modern neoliberalism and its hero effectively was Friedrich Hayek. Hayek was a brilliant um, thinker, Nobel Prize winning economist, also had a PhD in law, and he writes about law better than most lawyers I can think of. In fact, he takes Dicey to task for, for messing up his understanding um, of, of a constitutional law in his book, The Constitution of Liberty. And now Hayek essentially developed the idea of neoliberalism, a political theory of neoliberalism, which um, placed liberty uh, at the heart of, of what a state is meant to protect and promote and said that the, the rule of law idea effectively forbids the state seeking to obtain social justice. It, has, it places a se severe restraints on the growth of the administrative state. I had planned to go through Hayek's um, work, um, his argument in more detail, but I think I'll stick to what's on the slide in light of the, the time that I have. He essentially argued that the rule of law requires what's called a, what he called and others have called a nomocratic instead of teleocratic order. That means the state can provide rules 
to allow people to plan their own lives, but the state can't identify the ends that people should seek. So it's an anti-perfectionist theory. And he believed that any welfare state required the creation of institutions that would specify ends for people to meet. He thought it had to be perfectionist, in other words. He thought law was based on custom, that it, it helped delineate spheres of uh, reasonable expectations through property and contract rights, allowed people to plan their lives. And any administration and planning had to be minimized in his conception because it had to be based on legislation which would be unclear and would have to be adopted by the state forecasting uh, what kind of changes it could produce in the economy. And he had a theory of knowledge um, to explain why that was also impossible. I mean, the classic uh, target for Hayek's theories is a centrally planned economy. And I think much of what he argued in connection with a centrally planned economy is correct. It just so happens that social democrats can also see why essentially planned economies fail to work properly. <clears throat> now, it's in a way easy to say that this neoliberal account of the rule of law is just one view of it, and it's not even close to being a central view. Um, but we should recognize the ongoing significance of Hayek's critique. First of all, we can locate in as far back as Koch the idea that there's something wrong about discretion, administrative discretion. It's to be contrasted with law. And of course, we know that the welfare state requires discretion. Lord Hailsham, who was um, a member of Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister Thatcher's cabinet, said that uh, in his theory of democracy, as an alternative to regulation, Hailsham's theory propounds the rule of law. So he sees a direct conflict between these ideas. The, the uh, irascible commentator on the British constitution, John Griffith said the rule of law is an invaluable concept for those who don't want to change the present setup. And of course, the famous quote from Judith Sklar saying that the rule of law is like a football in a game between friends and enemies of free market liberalism. All these views, are pointing out how the rule of law value had been used to essentially oppose the creation of the regulatory state in the post-war period and were deployed in the period from the 1980s onwards to try to, to, to cut back on the welfare state. These views continue to be advocated today. These are all recent publications um, where in Barnett and Epstein's case, they're championing the idea of the rule of law in a libertarian fashion, Matai and Nader are pointing out how it's been used in the development context poorly, and Plant and Waldron are offering responses to those views. Now, you might think, you know, even if I say you need to take it seriously, that, that it's pretty clear that, that, you know, that Raz and Fuller and Waldron, all advocates of the formal conception, are social democrats, or they have social democratic tendencies, they're not neoliberals, and they have the widely accepted theories of the rule of law, so there's not much to, to worry about here. Now, I take a slightly different view. I think that, um, although I, I imagine many in the audience subscribe to, to some version of the formal theory, that the the views of Raz and Fuller haven't really effectively reconciled the rule of law to the welfare state. So we look at Raz's desiderata on the rule of law, and I'll be quick here. You can see just how much of this could be, if just stated blandly like this, in tension with a rule of law idea. That laws, uh, not with the rule of law idea, but with the building of the administrative and welfare state. The idea that all law should be clear well, we know that regulatory mandates are notoriously ambiguous and open-ended. The law should be stable. We know the law needs to be amended quite a bit. The making of particular laws should be guided by open, stable, and clear rules. Well, the, the rules um, governing delegated powers that are conferred by statutes are often very vague in nature, sometimes even skeletal. Um, and if I just skip down, since I'm in Australia, 
um, I'm speaking in Australia, the last item, the discretion of crime prevention agencies should not be allowed to pervert the law. Well, if we look at responsive and reflexive regulation, such as advocated by Braithwaite and others, you can see how there's a, there's a serious issue there. What I'm saying is with, a, with an undeveloped account of how the rule of law can deal with the administrative state, this view is vulnerable. In fact, um, Hayek, Raz is even more overtly vulnerable in the following way. Hayek claimed that the rule of law and the welfare state were incompatible. Raz argues that, <clears throat> you know, actually they are incompatible. And he didn't have a problem with it because as he puts it here, conflict between the rule of law and other values is just what's to be expected. He says Hayek's mistake was his assumption of the overriding importance of the rule of law. The idea here, uh, or my, my discomfort with this suggestion here is that um, effectively, Raz is simply accepting that the rule of law and the welfare state, these are two fundamentally important aspects of the modern, of any modern liberal democracy, that they are somehow incompatible with each other. That's like saying human rights and, the, and um, democracy are totally incompatible. I have no problem with that. I think we need to work a bit harder to try to see what is it about these two ideas that makes them coexist in a modern state. To leave the compatibility unanswered is to me a very serious problem. It leaves the welfare and administrative state vulnerable to the objections of, uh, of neoliberals that continue to exist. Now, I, I realize I need to stop. I think that's 31 minutes. I just wanted to put one last slide on the up to explain what I think is needed. In my view, what's needed is a restatement. Is that okay, Roz, if I just continue for one more minute? Yep. There's a need, in my view, to deal with where, uh, where the rule of law has ended up across the 20th century, to restate the ideal in a way that clarifies its supportive relationship to the welfare and regulatory step, state. And I see steps towards that as being focusing on the idea that the animating value in the rule of law is the idea of legally constraining arbitrary power. That is located in one tradition about the rule of law, the limited government tradition. I think that Julian Semple has done the best job at illuminating that tradition in his various essays. It's terrific work. There's another tradition that focuses on the essence of legality to try to tell us what the rule of law is. I think it's impoverished. Secondly, we need to recognize private arbitrary power as a rule of law concern. So anarchy in this view is incompatible with the rule of law for just this reason. Once we recognize private arbitrary power as a rule of law concern, we start to see administrative discretion in a different light. It starts to look more like police power to the holder of private property in the neoliberal conception. I think we need also to set out an account of arbitrariness, legality, and the limited government tradition that fits with the rule of law traditions that are the object of interpretation in offering a theory of the rule of law. And I think a number of thinkers are doing precisely this. Uh, Martin Krieger in his various works, Julian Semple brilliantly, Robin West, Philip Selznick, Elizabeth Anderson, the philosopher to some extent. And I am also writing a book setting out just such a theory over the next couple of years as I have been for the last six years. So I'll stop there and thank you very much.